For though at times I feel alone, I know that you are near. My heart just wants to follow. I'm willing to
good to be in God's house today, isn't it? It's good to be here to worship the Lord. We appreciate your coming to be with us on this first Sunday in November. This year is going by so quickly, and here we are in this latter part of the year. We're glad that you're here today as we recognize on this Sunday, Veterans Day. As you know, this coming Friday is Veterans Day, and we are going to be recognizing all of our veterans at the end of the service, so be sure and hang around for that. We have a presentation for them, so we appreciate your service. We appreciate all that you have done to keep our country safe and secure. I want to also remind you that next Sunday we'll be having offering a membership class in the conference room. If you're not yet a member, we'd like for you to come to that class at 10 o'clock next Sunday morning. And uh, we'll be glad to get all your information and get you ready to become a member next Sunday. If you're a member of a Church of God somewhere else and you'd like to transfer here, then we'll get that letter in the mail and then you can become a bona fide member of the Matthews Church of God next Sunday. So be sure and let us know about that. Also, we are going to be having a ladies' meeting. We're not, but the church is. We're going to be having a ladies' meeting this coming uh, Tuesday night in the fellowship hall. Bring light finger foods and have a good time of fellowship. Let me ask today, do we have any first-time visitors here? Anybody here for the very first time? We're glad that you're here. Any returning visitors? We appreciate your coming back. Anyone at all? How many church members do we have here today? All right, we have a few folks here that are members. Amen. We appreciate your being here. How many members do we have online that's watching from your couch? Shame on you. You should be here. You got an extra hour of sleep last night, and everybody's refreshed and ready to go today. We're glad to have you. So good to have the Burns back, isn't it? We have missed them. Amen. All their surgeries are over, and they're mending and doing well. We thank God for that. We're glad that they're back with us today. And others, we're glad to have you. Good to have uh, the Krajewski's uh, granddaughter with them today. Amen. Good to have you with us in service. Thank you for coming. Would you stand as we go to the Lord in prayer? We learned yesterday, in spite of everything uh, that uh, Jeff Brimmer has been going through, yesterday we learned that his father passed away. Remember him in prayer and him and, and Pearl Ann both, that God would touch them and give them strength. We don't understand why things happen the way they do, but we know God's in control. We trust him. We believe and and know that he has a plan and a purpose for all things. So pray for God's comfort. He is the God of all comfort. Pray for them today. Pray for this service. I just have a feeling that God is going to move in a special way in this service. We're going to be having communion in just a little while, so prepare your hearts for that as well. Father, we thank you today for your wonderful blessings to us. The goodness, the grace, the mercy and love you've shown to us day after day. Lord, we desire so much to get into your presence to feel your anointing, to feel your touch, to feel the renewal of our minds and our strength. We ask you to give comfort to these that are grieving, brokenhearted. Touch these that are lost, that they would call upon your name to be saved. We ask you, Lord, to let your anointing be upon every song, every singer, every musician, upon the communion. We pray, Lord, that the power of your Spirit would fill this place. We bless you and thank you for all the things that you've done, are doing, and will do, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you take a moment now and welcome one another to the Matthews Church of God. We're delighted to have you with us today.
continue to worship in our tithes and offering. From John 14, 27, it says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give with you. Praise God for peace of mind this morning that we can come together and worship him in the beauty of his holiness. Let us worship in our tithes and offering. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your sweet spirit that we feel here today. Father, we love you and praise you. Bless this offering for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. to him. I look to the hills which come with my help. My help comes from the Lord. Praise God. Our brethren are coming at this time to get ready to serve you. If this is the first time taking communion with us when you receive this, just be sure and uh, tear off the end, the smaller end first that reveals the bread and uh, hold that and we'll take it together and then the other end, you peel that off after we've taken the bread and have the juice. It is a sermon in itself Jesus said, as often as we do this, we show forth his death until he comes. We're remembering he died for us, but he also rose from the dead, and he's coming again. And according to everything I'm seeing and reading in the word of God, it could be at any time. So get ready. The Lord is coming, and we'll be able to sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb and have this with him afresh and anew. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We're able today to participate in this very sacred time of the service. As we partake of this bread and this juice, we recognize that it symbolizes your body and your blood. Lord, as we receive it today, we pray for healing for those that are sick, for strength for those that are weary. Lord, that you would help us along this life's journey. Lord, to receive from you all that we have, that you'll be real and near and dear to us this day. We ask you to bless it and sanctify it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul writes, For I have received of the Lord, that which also I delivered unto you, 
that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Thank you, Lord, your precious blood. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lamb of God. Thank you, Lamb of God. Halomosuri and Delavorito Rosatarus. Halomorondo Rosatrete Amaya Tales. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stand, if you will, please. Our brethren will come down the aisle and collect those items from you. Our praise team is coming to lead us in worship. Let the Spirit of God speak to you today and minister to you.
right now, can you just say his name with me? Just say Jesus. We need to fill this atmosphere with Jesus. Oh, Jesus, we call on your name today. We need you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, we worship you.
I feel him here today. I feel him in such a powerful way. We can just forget about everything else and just look to him, invite him, embrace him, enjoy him. The Lord is here. He is here. Praise God. Thank you, singers and musicians. Thank you so much. must be doing something right. The devil's been fighting, especially in the last couple of weeks, he's been fighting. Must be doing something right. I said, Lord, let this be. Turn, could you turn me down just a little bit up here? I'm getting some feedback. I don't want anything to hinder this service today. I want God to have his way. And uh, we fight. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities, darkness, the rulers of the darkness of this world. And we have to fight. We can't be passive. We can't just sit back and say, let it be what will be. We've got to fight. We've got to press in and take the kingdom by force to overcome the enemy of our souls. I'm reading today from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 6, verses 13 through 16. And when it was to him, his disciples, and of them he chose 12, whom also he named apostles Simon, whom he also named Peter, Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip, and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas. James the son of Alphaeus and Simon called Zealots and Judas the brother of James and Judas Iscariot which also was the traitor. I want to speak to you today about chosen by the master. Chosen by the master. Would you pray for God's touch today? Father we need your touch. We need your touch. We need you to fill this room with your holy presence. We need you to rend the heavens and to come down and dwell among your people. That you could break the chains and fetters and shackles asunder. Deliver those that are bound and oppressed of the devil to restore the joy of your salvation. Lift us up above the shadows. Lift us up into heavenly places. We ask you, Lord, today to take care of every hindrance every distraction let us be laser focused upon you look upon your face to desire you to desire to draw nearer to you I pray you would touch me Holy Ghost and help me I just want to get lost in you today I want to be absorbed in you today I want your word to be in me and me in your word I want to be wrapped up in you Lord help us Lord God, today to experience you afresh and anew. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We pray that we would not quench you, that we would not vex you, that we would not resist you, but we would yield unto you today. We give you all the glory, all the praise, all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The 12 apostles were men chosen by Jesus Christ. That alone gives them a very special place. To be chosen of the Lord is a wonderful, wonderful privilege that God has given to us. To be chosen, to be God's chosen people. He said in Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 6, for thou art and holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God have chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. Above all people that are upon the face of the earth. A chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. 
a peculiar people. Out of all the people on the face of the earth, the Lord has chosen you and he has chosen me. We are special in that he chose us from the very beginning. We were not an afterthought with God. He says in Ephesians 1 and 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He said, that many are called, but few are chosen. He also said, he, we didn't choose him, but he chose us. We are not copies. The Lord did not use a cookie cutter manner to select us, to create us. We're all originals. We're all individuals with our individual fingerprints individual eye patterns, individual DNA, individual everything from our voices. Everything about us is unique. Out of almost 8 billion people in this world, there is no one exactly like you. You are one of a kind. You were made special by our creator God, made special in his likeness and in his image. He said you are the apple of his eye. His eye is upon the sparrow, but he also watches over you. There's not anything that can happen in your life that surprises God. There's not anything that can happen to you that catches God off guard. He is Adonai. He is sovereign. His eyes go to and fro in all the earth, and he sees and he knows everything. You have been chosen by God. The master. The Lord doesn't choose in a casual or in a careless manner. The 12 disciples were all different from each other. And that in itself should be something that should encourage us today. We are all different. Every one of us is different. But God created us different. He wanted us to be different. He didn't want us to be the same. He created us with our uniqueness. He created us with our individual gifts and talents and abilities. An apostle that he had called, an apostle that he had chosen, was someone who had followed Jesus from his baptism unto his ascension. An apostle was someone who was an eyewitness of Jesus Christ after his resurrection. He was chosen he was appointed by the Lord himself. The men who met the master first are interesting to me. Meet the men this morning who met the master first. There was Simon Peter we know. There was James and John and Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew. There was Matthew and Thomas and James the less. Thaddeus or Judas, not Iscariot. Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot. These are the men who first met the Lord Jesus Christ. These were the men that met the Savior. They were called and they were chosen by the Master. We often wonder why did Jesus choose these men over all the others? Why did he choose them over everyone else? But then again we ask ourselves, why did he choose me? Why did he choose me out of almost eight billion people in the world? He chose me. He chose me. I don't know why he did, but I'm glad that he did. I'm glad he chose you. Praise God. Jesus chose these men as his disciples. They were all different, and we we're all different. But he saw something special in them, and he sees something special in you. I've talked to I don't know how many people lately. I don't know what's going on with folks, but there's a lot of people that spend all their time beating themselves up, putting themselves down, 
constantly talking about themselves and talking about uh, how that they feel so so terrible about themselves. But you're beautiful inside and out because you're a creation of God. Don't you let the devil put that in your mind. You're unique. You're special. You belong to God. You're a, you're a temple of the Holy Ghost and you have something to be thankful for today. When Michelangelo looked at a particular piece of marble, he saw what ended up becoming the angel holding the candelabra. And they asked him, they said, how could you create something so beautiful, such a beautiful artwork out of a simple marble slab? And he said, I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set him free. When God looked at us, he did not see what we were. He saw what we could become. He began to carve away and chip away and he put us on his potter's wheel and began to spin us until he began to smooth out the roughness in our lives and to fill in the voids and then he began to temper us in his refiner's fire to burn out all the dross. But I want to tell you we're not a finished product. We're not a finished work. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. He didn't see me as, as what I was but he saw me as what I could become and he's been working on me ever since. Everything I've gone through, every storm I've faced, every valley I've trottled through, it's all because he's working on me to form me, to shape me, to be more like Jesus and oh I want to be like Jesus. I want to know him and experience him. Praise God. He's still working on me. Philippians 1, 6. Being confident in this very thing. That he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's going to keep working on us. We become flawed, we become mess ups, we, be, we become failures oftentimes, but he gets us and he continues to work on us. He doesn't throw away the clay when you stumble, when you fall, when you fail. He doesn't cast you aside. He just picks you back up again, puts you back on the potter's wheel and say, I'm not finished with you yet. I'm not going to give up on you yet. I want to make you a vessel of honor, sanctified and meet for my use. Disciples were common, ordinary people. From all walks of life, they were fishermen. At least four of the apostles were fishermen. That might explain that one of the early symbols of Christianity was the fish. In the Greek, the word for fish is ichthus. And ichthus was used as an acronym or an acrostic that would form the words Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. So everywhere they went, they saw these fish symbols. And they were saying, uh, we're, we're, we're symbolizing Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God and who is our Savior. There were farmers among the disciples. There were craftsmen. There were publicans. And there were zealots. They all personally met the Master and were deeply affected by him. If you haven't been affected by him, then you haven't met him. If you've ever met Jesus Christ, you'll never be the same again. You'll never be the same individual again. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. No one ever touched me like Jesus Christ. He dug me out of a pit, brought me out of the muck and mire of sin, set my feet on a solid rock, and established my goings. He changed my life. They were drawn to Jesus like a lightning rod. They were drawn to him and their lives were profoundly changed. I'm in church today because Jesus Christ changed me. These folks, you can't get them to church if you give them a free meal because they haven't met Jesus Christ. You meet Jesus Christ, you'll be glad when they say, let us go to the house of the Lord because upon this rock Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is and exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day of the Lord approaching. So much, so much their lives were affected. I can't understand people. They'll tell you they're a Christian. I'm a Christian. 
And just as soon as somebody looks at them with cross eyes, they're gone. Just as soon as somebody says something that hurts their feelings, they're gone. But these people were so profoundly affected by Jesus Christ, they were willing to die for him. Simon Peter was crucified upside down, history tells us, because he said, I'm not worthy to die in the same position of my Lord. Turn, this, turn me upside down on the cross. Let me die in the opposite way because I'm not worthy. That's, that's the kind of men that Jesus had called. Andrew was crucified. Thomas was pierced through with spears from four soldiers. Philip had won the wife of a Roman proconsul. And to retaliate against him, the Roman proconsul had Philip arrested and had him cruelly put to death. Matthew was martyred. He was slain with a halberd. A halberd is a combination of a spear and a battle axe. Bartholomew was cruelly beaten and then crucified. James, the son of Alphaeus, was stoned and then clubbed to death. James, the son of, of Zebedee, was beheaded. Simon the Zealot was martyred after refusing to offer a sacrifice to a son God, and he was sown in half. Thaddeus or Judas, as one, one writer puts his name, not Iscariot, was killed with arrows when he refused to deny the faith of Christ. And then John is believed to be the only disciple who, did, who died of old age of natural death because God needed him as a secretary. God needed him as a scribe to record the things of the book of Revelation. God still had a work for him to do. Let me tell you, God's not going to take you out until he's through with you on this earth, until the work is finished. He's going to keep you around. And history tells us that they put old John in a cauldron of boiling oil, but he escaped without being burned. You say, well, you believe that? I believe it because there was three Hebrew guys that were thrown into a fiery furnace and they did not burn and the fourth man in the fire was the son of God oh the fire will not burn you the water will not drown you because he's the deliverer praise God <laughs> hallelujah they were profoundly changed they met the master I'm glad I met Jesus Christ there's a lot of folks that have met the pastor. They met the deacons. They met the elders. They met the church members. They've gone all over the creeds and the doctrines of the church. They've done all that. But how many have met the master? Do you remember when you met him? Do you remember when you came to him? Such a love that he had, such grace that he showed, such mercy was given. You come to him, he would have known why he's cast you out. With all your hang-ups, with all your faults, with all your failures, you can come to Jesus. He will in no wise cast you out. This world will turn its back on you. This world will use you and abuse you and discard you, but not the Lord. He's still working. He's still creating. He's still making believers and disciples to follow him and to do his will. But after the Lord was crucified, the disciples became disillusioned. They became discouraged. They were so overwhelmed with fear that they went into hiding. The one they thought was the Messiah, the one they had sold out for, was dead. And their hope in him as the Savior of the world was crushed. It was crushed. And they began to disperse. They began to go back to their, their old lives, their old way of living, going back to Fishing, going back to their trades. They begin to go back. Looks like a lot of people these days are living in the pre-resurrection era. A lot of people these days are living like Jesus is dead. They're living as though there was never a resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead changed everything. Changed it all. They were no longer hiding. They stopped their hiding. They started walking on the streets. Even after they had been commanded by the leaders and the rulers, don't speak anymore in his name. 
Don't mention the name of Jesus. They said we cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. We ought to obey God rather than man. And they walked the streets preaching and proclaiming Jesus Christ is alive. He was crucified. He was buried. But on the third day he arose from the dead. And he's alive and well today. And they became eyewitnesses. Eyewitness news didn't just start with a TV station. The eyewitnesses were right here. The gospels. They give to us an eyewitness account of Jesus Christ. There was only one explanation for the change in their, their demeanor. There was an only one explanation for the change in their, in their living. Jesus Christ was alive. <laughs> and the disciples had seen him with their own eyes. Eyewitnesses of the resurrected Lord. And they knew beyond any doubt. That Jesus Christ was alive, that he had risen from the dead. And they were willing, they were willing to face a lifetime of hardship and persecution and even death to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, no one will do that for a lie. If this is all a lie, no one would do that. It has been said men will die for what they believe to be true, though it may actually be false. They, they do not, however, die for what they know to be a lie. They would not go through what they went through. They would not have died a martyr's death if they believed this to be a lie. They knew it was the truth. They said, we're eyewitnesses. We've seen him with our own eyes. Thomas said, I've touched him. I've touched him. He's alive, praise God. I doubted it like so many people have doubted it, Thomas said. But oh, he walked into the room. And when he walked into the room, I didn't have to touch his hands. I didn't have to touch his side. I could see and know for my own self. He is Jesus Christ. He is the son of the living God. Oh, do you know him today? Oh, bless you. No man would be willing to die unless they knew it to be the truth. Edward Gibbon, who wrote the book, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, listed five reasons for the spread of Christianity in that first century. And one, he said, is the pure, honest, sincere, and truthful behavior of the disciples. This anything we need to be is to be pure, honest, sincere, and truthful in our behavior as disciples of Jesus Christ. People are watching our lives. The apostles were so committed that they were willing to sacrifice their lives, willing to give their lives up. That kind of commitment requires a true confidence in knowing that Jesus Christ is God. I have no doubt there were those who were confused about who Jesus was. Jesus just came out and asked his disciples, he said, who is everybody saying that I am? Who does men say that I am? And they said, well, Lord, some said you're Elijah. So some said that, that you're one of the prophets, maybe Jeremiah. Some, some said that, you, that, that you're John the Baptist raised from the dead. But he said, who do you say that I am? Inspired from the Father above through the Holy Ghost. Simon Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I have no out about it. You are Jesus the Son of God. I tell you today I have no doubt. I have no reservation. I can tell you on the authority of God's word Jesus Christ is Lord. He's the Son of the living God. Praise God. Help us Holy Ghost. These men were tortured. They were flogged. They were facing death by some of the cruelest methods of that day. They were willing to die a martyr's death because they were chosen, chosen by the master. They believed in his deity that much. He is the son of God. Do you know him today? Do you know him? Do you know him? I want you to ask yourself and answer that. Do I really know Jesus Christ? Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Everybody, it is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We're not self-made. We're not an accident. Accidents happen, but you and I didn't just happen. We were purposed. 
we were created in the design of God, in the mind of God, in the will of God. He said, I want you to exist. He planned you. He formed you. He made you who you are. He created you to be his chosen people. God has a specific work for each of us. He created us on purpose and for a purpose. He says in Ephesians 2 and 10, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the things he planned for us long ago. There are some folks, they think everything's but chance, just coincidence, just happened. They think the universe is here by chance. Have you looked at the universe lately? Do you think that happened just because of an explosion? A creator, a God in heaven who stretched out the heavens, measured them by the span of his hand. A God so great that he created everything. Man can see with a telescope and beyond. The Milky Way, the Orion, Pleiades. He created it all, the sun, the moon, the stars. He put everything in its orbit. He put every star in its socket and gave them a name. He created everything. He lets the waters wash back and forth in the hollow of his hand. There's a lot of these climate folks that are scared to death. The climate's going to destroy the earth. Let me tell you, the Bible says there's going to be a day of destruction, but it's going to be on God's term and in God's time. He has a plan for all things. We're not going to run out of water. We're not going to run out of resources because God God is our resource. God is our provider. He's the way maker. Oh, we better save Mother Earth, they tell us. Well, Earth is not a mother. God is the father. He's the creator. God said he's going to perform his word. His word's going to come to pass. If the Lord came today, and he could, there would be seven years of tribulation. First three and a half will be years of prosperity and craft will prosper and people think well that was the problem all those Christians all those believers they're gone wherever they're gone we don't care because we're getting along fine after three and a half years the Antichrist is going to reveal himself for the false guy that he is and the people the Jews are going to recognize that he they've been fooled they've been sold a, a bill of goods and the, the world is going to fall under the worst persecution and the worst trouble that it's ever known, a tribulation, the Bible says, like the world has never known. It's going to be a horrible time. You're already seeing everything get into place with all the digi digitizing of everything, all the different things you can do now. You can just scan this and scan that. They're preparing for the mark. People will receive the mark, and once they receive the mark, they're forever doomed. There's going to be a seven-year tribulation. But after that, there's going to be a thousand year millennial reign where the saints of God are going to rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to fix everything. He's going to turn this thing around. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. Everywhere you go, you won't see billboards to Budweiser and some of the other foolish things that go on in the world. It's going to say holiness under the Lord. People that despise holiness, people that hate holiness, let me tell you that's God. God is holy. His word is holy. Heaven is is holy. His people is holy. You can't get to heaven without holiness. It takes the holiness of God to serve him and to live for him. The earth is not by chance. God created it. Life that we live is not by chance. All the fortunate circumstances in life are not by chance. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I'd hate to live in a world where I had to depend on chance and on luck. Depend on chance and luck. No, these things are all created by God and for him. God has prepared a work for us. But he's looking for total commitment. You know, if there's anything you see today, everywhere you go, there are businesses that are closing down because they can't get people to work. There's places you go, everywhere you go, it says now hiring. We'll, we'll pay you X amount of money to come and work. We'll give you a couple of days off the, this week during the week if you'll come work for us. I saw, I think, the other day where Chick-fil-A is offering a three-day work week and people are lining up to work three days because they don't work five days. They want some leisure time. They want time to get into mischief. They want time to go to the clubs. They want time to, to live their own life. And all there, there are those who, who have gotten to the place to where that, that they're just not committed even to the workplace. They're not committed to the church. We've never seen a time when people were less committed to the church than today. We've never seen a time when people had it tough. 
And people had it difficult. When they worked their, their, work, their work that they had that was so difficult. And they had made very little money. Barely could get by. But they'd show up for church. They'd be there in church. I grew up in a small church. David uh, Bowles is here today. His dad used to pastor where I, where I went to church. And our church averaged probably 39 people for the most of the time. 39, 40, 50 people. 60. We were hitting high cotton when we got up to 69. We didn't know what to do with all the folks that were coming. We thought we had a crowd. But that was all we could get. Couldn't get any more to come. And all but yet people that did come were faithful. Those that were members were faithful. People that were committed to Christ came to the house of God. They'd be there on Sunday morning for Sunday school when the kids would get up and sing. Everybody ought to be a booster. This little light of mine. When we would sing, everybody ought to come to Sunday school. They'd come for that. And then we'd go to Sunday school. And then we would come out for worship. And then we'd go back home and we'd come back on Sunday night. And then we'd come on Monday night for the fellowship meeting. We would come on Wednesday night for Wednesday night fam for the service we'd have on Wednesday evening, the prayer meeting. On Saturday, we would have YPE, the young people endeavor, the youth people, the young people, and everybody would come out. The ladies would have their hair in colors, and they would have the scars and kerchiefs over their heads, but they'd come to church. You can't get people to church today because they're too busy. They've got other places to go. I wonder, have you met Jesus Christ? Because when you meet Jesus Christ, people are going to start coming to church. They're going to start seeking God. The altars were always filled. And I said, God help us. I'm a sapper today. I'm so tired of looking at empty altars. I'm tired of giving altar invitations and nobody coming. It seems as though everybody has got everything that they need. But Jesus said the Laodicean crowd, he said that's exactly how they're going to be. We're rich. We're increased with goods. We have need of nothing. I don't need to go to the altar preacher. Everything's fine. Just give me a song and a sermon and I'm done for the week. But oh, I want to know him. I want to experience him. I want to draw near to him. I I don't want to just go to church and go through the motions and say I'm one and done. I want to get up close to Christ. I want to be like John who leaned on him or Mary who sat at his feet or the man who tore the roof off the building to get to him. Oh, I want to get close to Jesus Christ. You cannot, it's impossible to follow the Lord half-hearted impossible. It's impossible to follow him from a distance. There was a pastor of a little Scottish church. He was getting up in years. I think about that sometimes. I'm getting older. But he was getting up in years. So the people asked him to resign. A little Scottish church. They said, Pastor, we We'd like for you to resign. We haven't seen a conversion in an entire year. The old preacher said, hey, it's been a lean year, but there was one, there was one. The elder asked him, he said, one conversion? Who was it? The old preacher replied in his Scottish accent, hey, it was wee Bobby. It was wee Bobby that got saved. They'd forgotten about that little lad. He got saved one Sunday morning when they had a mission service. And when they passed the plates, when they got to wee Bobby, he asked the usher, he said, would you, would you put it on the floor? The usher complied and placed the plate on the floor. And wee Bobby got up in the plate with his bare feet. And he said, I give all of myself because that's all I have to give. That's all I have to give. We Bobby was changed that day because he became the world-renowned Robert Moffat. Robert Moffat joined his son-in-law, David Livingstone, as missionaries to Africa. Here's an example of a totally committed life. I don't have a lot to offer. Maybe you can't play a musical instrument. Maybe you can't carry a tune in a bucket. Maybe you can't do some crafts. Maybe you can't do some other things. But oh God, whatever, whatever I can do. If I can be an encourager, if I can be a helper, if I can be a giver, if I can be somebody that can just say, boy, here I am, God. I'm totally committed to you. Example of total commitment. You know, you got to fall in love with Jesus. 
you got to fall in love with him. When you fall in love, you remember what it was like when you fell in love? You'd spend money you didn't have to buy things to give to your girlfriend or your boyfriend. You wanted to show that love. You wanted to express that love. You wanted them to know that you loved them, that you cared for them. Do you know Jesus Christ today? Do you know him as the son of God? I want to know him. I want to know him. I bear down. I do. I bear down. Because I, I don't want to just say a prayer. Anybody can say a prayer. You can learn a little prayer, a little poem. You can quote a poem. You can give a little evening vesper. We often say our table graces. God bless this fool. We, we can say that and think that's okay. But let me tell you there's a difference when you pray the effectual, fervent prayer. There's a difference when you pray and you get the Spirit of God on you. When the disciples saw Jesus praying in the Spirit, they saw what was happening. They realized what the Pharisees and Sadducees had was nothing. They said, Lord, we need you to teach us how to do something. It wasn't to preach. It wasn't to teach. It wasn't to sing. It wasn't to form a committee. It wasn't to do this or that. They said, Lord, would you teach us how to pray? Teach us how to pray like that. Teach us how to pray through. Let me tell you, I grew up with people knowing how to pray. I grew up when, we, when the men would get together and go over to Vernon Nancy's house where he had set up a place in the field with, with bales of hay and lanterns and the men would get in the field and they would pray. I grew up when people would pray in the Sunday school class and the Spirit of God would fall and they never made it out to the sanctuary. I grew up in a church where people got around the altar and the altar became stained with tears. Let me tell you, that's what got the church where it is today. Not some little namby-pamby, not somebody playing a church and going through the motion. I'm talking about getting a hold of the horn to the altar of God and saying, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I need you, Lord. I want to know him. I want to know him. He's all in this book if you want to know him. In Genesis, he's the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the high priest. In Numbers, he's the smitten rock. In Deuteronomy, he's the prophet like unto Moses. Hallelujah. In Joshua, he's the captain of the Lord's host. In Judges, he's the righteous judge and the law giver. In Ezra, in, 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 uh, in Ruth, rather, he's the kinsman redeemer. In Samuel, he's the seed of David. In Kings, he's the reigning king. In Chronicles, he's the God of our Father. In Ezra, he's the Lord of heaven and of earth. In Nehemiah, he's the prayerful builder. In Esther, he's the prevailing intercessor. In Job, he's the risen and returning redeemer. In Psalms, he's the shepherd. In Proverbs, he's the wisdom of God. In Ecclesiastes, he's the wise man. In the Song of Solomon, he's the loving bridegroom. In Isaiah, he's the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, he's the weeping prophet. In Lamentations, he's the man of sorrows. In Ezekiel, he's the glorious one. In Daniel, he's the smiting stone. In Hosea, he's the refreshing dew. In Joel, he's the baptizer with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Hallelujah. In Amos, he's the burden bearer. In, in in Obadiah, he is the, the satisfying possession. In Jonah, he's the risen prophet. In Micah, he's the caster away of our sins. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God forever. He is the one, praise God, who is the ancient of days and the Lord of glory. He's the one that's called us out of darkness into his marvelous, marvelous light. In Habakkuk, he is, he is the, the one who cries as the evangelist, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In Zephaniah, he is, he is the glad singer, praise God. In, in Haggai, he's the desire of all nations. In and, uh, Zach Zach Zephaniah and Zechariah and Zephaniah and Zechariah he is the smitten shepherd in Malachi he's the son of righteousness with healing in his wings in Matthew he's the king of Jews in Mark he's the suffering servant in Luke he's the son of man in John he's the son of God in Acts he's the ascended Lord in, in Romans he's the propitiation of our sins in Corinthians he's the last Adam hallelujah oh in Galatians he's the redeemer from the curse of the law in 
Ephesians, he's the whole armor of God. In Philippians, he's the supplier of our every need. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. In Colossians, he is the God ahead. In Thessalonians, he's the coming Lord. In Timothy, he is the, he's the mediator. In Titus, he's our blessed hope. Praise God. In Philemon, he's the payer of our debt. In Hebrews, he's the captain of our salvation. In James, he's the father of life. In Peter, he's the day star. In John, he's the word of life. In June, he's the only wise God. In Revelation, he's the Alpha and Omega. I want to know him. I want to know him. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his suffering. I don't want to just play. I don't want to go through the motions. I want to know Jesus Christ. He called me. He chose me. He anointed me. He appointed me, and I belong to him. Would you stand with me, please? Hallelujah. Oh, that I may know him. Oh, we welcome you, Lord. We welcome you, Holy Ghost. We welcome you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, worship him. Worship him. Don't you want to know him? Don't you want more of God? Aren't you hungry for more of him? Don't you desire him today? Hallelujah. Oh, the heads are bowed, the eyes are closed, the saints are praying. He says in John 15, 19, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. Because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. I've chosen you out of the world. This old world is not my home. I'm just passing through. The ship is going to get tossed from side to side. The winds are going to blow. Trouble is going to come. But my anchor, my faith holds in Jesus Christ. He's a place of sure standing, the rock of all ages. I wonder, is there anybody here today who will say, Pastor, I want to know Jesus Christ. I don't really know him the way you described him. I don't really know him as I should. But today, I'm going to press in. Today, I'm going to come to him. And I'm going to give him all, all of me, all that I have. I'm going to give him all of me. I belong to him. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Here I am, Lord. I might know you. That I might experience you. Is there anybody else who will just come and say, Lord, I don't know you as I should, but I want to. I want to know you better. I want to know you more. I want to get closer to you than I've ever been in my life. You've got to have him. It's going to take all of you, as we sing about earlier, all of you, give all yourself to him. Would you come all over the building? Let's find a place.